Welcome to Procurement 101 for School Nutrition Programs. This training is designed for school food authorities that participate in the National School Lunch Program. My name is Sarah Platt and I will be presenting this training. The objectives of this training are to provide a basic understanding of procurement, including being able to identify the different types of procurement methods, being able to appropriately apply procurement methods when making purchases, and learning about required procurement policies. So what exactly is procurement? Procurement is the process of purchasing goods and services for your food service program from a vendor. And because school nutrition programs receive federal funds, they are required to follow specific procurement steps. In fact, any program that receives federal funds must also follow these same procurement practices. So as I just said, procurement is purchasing goods and services from a vendor. When making the purchase, there are different methods that you can use. They're called micro, small, and formal purchase methods. You use these methods to buy a good or a service, so food, supplies, equipment, or repair for your food service program. And you will buy from what we generically call a vendor, but this could be a store, a local farmer, a commercial distributor, or even an equipment company. There are four key principles to procurement that must be followed with each procurement transaction. These include the Buy American provision, complying with federal, state, and local regulations, ensuring full and open competition, and purchasing from vendors who are both responsive and responsible. And we're going to go through um, what we mean by each of these. The USDA Buy American provision requires schools participating in the National School Lunch Program to purchase food items that have been grown and processed in the United States. This provision applies to two types of food products that schools buy, agricultural commodities and processed food products. Unprocessed agricultural commodities must be grown in the United States, and this includes fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. Processed products must contain at least 51% agricultural commodities that have been grown in the United States and also be processed in the United States. Examples of processed products include canned and frozen fruits or vegetables, juice, milk, yogurt, entree items such as pizza and chicken products. Processed items can be a little bit trickier um, to determine if they're compliant with this provision because 51% of the items in the product that are used towards crediting, um, so the meat meat alternate or the grain, these are the items that must be grown and processed in the United States. So there are two situations where there are exceptions to the Buy American provision, but before using these exceptions, you must first consider if there's an alternative domestic product that meets meal pattern requirements that you could use instead. So the first exception that you can use is availability the agricultural product is not grown in the United States in sufficient quantities. And the second exception to this provision is cost. If a competitive cost comparison shows that the cost of a U.S. product is significantly higher than the non-domestic product, then you may choose to use this exception. But again, before uh, using one of these exceptions, you do need to consider an alternate option first. So to ensure compliance with the Buy American provision, you want to think about how you will include this as part of the procurement process when you're looking to procure food products. You need to make sure that vendors are aware of the requirement. So that means for a formal procurement process, you would do this by including Buy American information in the solicitation document and also in your product specifications. For small purchase procedures, when you're um, purchasing a food product using these methods, you're going to request price quotes and again, make sure to include the Buy American requirement. You can do this when you're emailing the vendor or um, if you're even making a phone call to the vendor to request these quotes, you would include this information in your email or when you're speaking with the vendor. 
And for micro purchases, often you're doing a micro purchase by going to a local store. So let's say that's a grocery store. Typically you will see, um, for example, with produce, signage indicating where that produce is, is from. So you can apply the Buy American requirements um, with micro purchasing by checking out um, that labeling when you're at the store. Here are the various procurement regulations. It's important to note that 2 CFR 200 applies to all programs that receive federal funds, not only or not just school nutrition programs. The seven CFR regulations are specific to school nutrition programs. Um, you can see they're specific to the summer food service program, the national school lunch program, and the school breakfast program. Your local requirements may be more restrictive than federal regulations, and that's okay, but they cannot be less restrictive than federal regulations. In the private sector, it's not uncommon to find a vendor that you like working with and to be very loyal to them. However, this is not allowed in government procurement, so when spending federal funds. So for that reason, the third principle to procurement is achieving full and open competition. So this is achieved when all possible vendors are on a level playing field and they can submit a response to your solicitation if they choose to. Creating a level playing field should lead to better pricing and it also shows that you're impartial. School nutrition funds, again, these are federal funds and we need to be impartial when we are um, going through the procurement process. So when you think about it, you know, from a personal level, how would you feel if your tax dollars were being spent to purchase something just because the agency liked the company or just because they liked the salesperson that they're doing business with? You would probably be upset because it's not proper management of your tax day or taxpayer dollars, excuse me. And so the same concept applies here. And of course, there are some areas when it can be difficult to find competition. Um, so in Maine, for example, sometimes with our milk deliveries, we have um, not as much competition there. Or in a very rural area, it can be a challenge. But you need to ask yourself that if there are more vendors that could respond and you're finding that you're not, then there's probably something that you are doing to restrict compet competition. And you need to determine what that is and remove that barrier. Creating full and open competition can be achieved by researching what vendors are out there and soliciting responses from as many vendors as you can, making sure that you give adequate time for the vendor to respond to your request, and making sure that you're not being overly restrictive, um, which can be caused by you know, specifying a brand name, for example, or requiring that the vendor have unnecessary experience or even placing unreasonable requirements on the vendor. So to create full and open competition, you also wanna make sure that you're being very transparent about the process and making sure that you're following the code of conduct, which is one of the required policies you are to have. And we'll talk about that later in this presentation. There are three types of procurement methods. When the estimated value of a procurement is below a certain threshold, sometimes called a small purchase threshold or simple acquisition threshold, informal procurement methods can be used. The threshold is the maximum amount that you can spend on a purchase before having to use a more formal purchasing procedure. Informal procurement procedures include micro and small purchase, Informal procurement expedites the process and is less burdensome than the formal procurement process. It's important to note here that your local thresholds may be more restrictive than these federal thresholds listed on the screen. So you'll need to check the federal procurement manual or the procurement procedures specific for your district. Throughout this presentation, I will be referring to the federal thresholds. So we're now going to go through each of the uh, procurement micro, small, and formal procurement methods. The micro purchase method is everybody's favorite because it's non-competitive. You don't do a price comparison. You can just go out and buy what you want as long as the price is reasonable. 
Micro-purchase procedures can be used when the aggregate amount of the purchase is less than or equal to $10,000 or $50,000 if you self-certify, which we'll talk about in a minute. Micro-purchases should be distributed equally among qualified suppliers as much as you possibly can. So instead of purchasing from the same vendor every time, you should be shopping from a variety of vendors and distributing your purchases equitably. Again, prices must be reasonable, which can be determined by comparing prices with what you've paid for the product in the past, or maybe even having just personal knowledge of the cost of an item. Keep in mind that while this is not necessarily the most economical option when making a purchase, prices still must be reasonable. And of course, keep records to make sure um, you're compliant. So that would include receipts um, and possibly even a note as to why micro-purchases practices were used. Procurement regulations specify that non-federal entities, this is an organization that receives federal funds and is not the US government, Non-federal entities can use the micro-purchase threshold currently set at $10,000, or they can self-certify and set a threshold up to $50,000. If you would like to increase the micro-purchase threshold from $10,000 to $50,000 and self-certify, you would do this by first qualifying as a low-risk auditee. Basically, this means you're considered low-risk in the annual single audit that your district receives. The next step to self-certify, you're going to write down why you want a higher micro-purchase threshold and what that amount will be. This might include a statement stating that it's not always possible to go out and get price quotes, or it's maybe not the best use of your time to go out and get price quotes from multiple vendors. And then you wanna save the documentation. So the copy of the statement, copy of the audit report, and this process needs to be repeated annually. The law says that you must self-certify on an annual basis. So each year you need to check the district's audit report, make sure you're low risk, redoing your statement, and keeping documentation. The other informal method is the small purchase method. This is sometimes referred to as three bids and a buy. This method does take a little bit more work than when you're micro-purchasing, because it is a competitive process. You need to get price quotes from ideally two or three vendors before actually making the purchase. And when you make the purchase, it needs to be from the lowest price offer that meets your requirements. The small purchase method is used when the value of your purchase is $250,000 or less, or whatever your local threshold is if it's more restrictive. It's typically used when you're buying an item repeatedly over and over again throughout the year, or perhaps if you really want to only purchase from one vendor and not shopping around. Before you get price quotes, you must have written specifications of what it is you are looking for, including the Buy American provision if you're shopping for food. And um, it's really important that you share that identical information with each vendor. Documentation of this process must also be kept. The steps to the small purchase process include drafting the solicitation, make sure to include the Buy American statement for food purchases, contacting at least two to three potential vendors, documenting their responses and price quotes, evaluating the quotes received, and monitoring the contract. Now let's go into each of these in a bit more detail. So the first step in the small purchase process is to draft the solicitation document. This needs to be done before you contact any potential vendor because you, you need to make sure that you're giving the exact same information to each potential vendor. The solicitation document must include written specifications describing in detail what it is you're looking for and the quantity. It needs to include a statement on how the award will be made, such as to the lowest price vendor based on bottom line or line item or as a group. You'll also have to provide any required contract provisions in 2 CFR 200, as well as the Buy American requirement when making 
food purchases. So after you've drafted your solicitation document, the next step is to share it with potential vendors. USDA regulations state that you need to get quotes from an adequate number of qualified sources. So this is at least two, but it's in your best interest to contact as many as you can. There are some different ways that you can find potential vendors, including doing a web search, um, contacting the broker or company directly to ask who in Maine or your local area may carry their products. Depending on what you're purchasing, there may be staff within your district that you could ask about potential vendors. And of course, there's always your fellow school nutrition directors that you can reach out to and ask. And the third step is to document. Of course, you must document the process, especially for verbal quotes. You must write down all relevant information that was shared and received from the potential vendor. So the documentation should include the specifications that you asked for, um, along with the quantity and estimated usage, the name of the company, the contact information for the person giving you the quote, the date of the quote, and the source of the quote, meaning did you receive it over the telephone, through email, by going through a website, and write down the quoted price as well, along with the duration of that price. If you are getting a verbal quote, again, make sure to write this all down. It's very important that you document this. If it's over email or you received a paper submission, that can suffice as the documentation. Once you have an adequate number of quotes, it's time to evaluate them and determine who to award the contract to. So the first thing you need to do is verify that each vendor is responsive. This means that they did what was asked of them, such as meeting the deadline to respond or responding to all requests for information in the solicitation document. And also making sure that the items quoted meet your specifications. You also need to make sure that each vendor is responsible this means that they're capable of performing under the contract. If a vendor is not deemed to be responsive and or responsible, you must remove their quote from the evaluation, even if it is the lowest price quote. You still hang on to it for documentation purposes, but it is not part of the evaluation. So for example, let's say you are requesting quotes for milk and you want the milk delivered in a refrigerated truck. You receive a response from a vendor, but they indicate that they do not have a refrigerated truck. So even if they offer the lowest price for the product, they are not considered responsible. They cannot perform under the conditions of the contract. So once you remove a vendor that is not responsive and or responsible, you'll compare quotes from the vendors that you have determined are. When comparing quotes, you must compare apples to apples. So for example, if one vendor quotes you $2.33 for a six pack of whole grain hamburger buns, but the other vendor quotes you $2.53 for an eight pack, which one do you think would be the lowest price per unit? You might assume that the $2.33 hamburger buns is a better option. However, when you look at the pack size and consider the price per unit, it is actually going to be less expensive with the eight pack. So make sure you are comparing price per unit. Once you evaluate all responses, you will award the contract to the lowest price, responsive and responsible vendor. The next step is to award the contract. This means that you notify the vendor that was selected, that they were selected, and you can then discuss next steps. You should also notify the vendors that did not win. As always, keep all documentation from this process. You'll need to ensure the vendor performs as agreed to in the solicitation. This includes making sure the correct item in an acceptable state is being delivered and that the invoice contains all needed information, the price is correct, they provide you any rebates or discounts that you're entitled to, that there are no additional fees that weren't agreed to. And of course, this is when you also wanna make sure they're abiding by the Buy American provision if possible. Up to this point, we've covered micro and small purchase procedures. And you may be wondering, how do you determine which one you should be using? Some key things to consider 
are whether or not you're making a one-time purchase. If that's the case, micro-purchasing would probably be best. If you'd like to shop from different vendors and share the wealth, so to speak, micro-purchase procedures would be the right choice. If you're looking to buy repeatedly from the same vendor, you want to use small purchase procedures. And if you're looking for the lowest price, you want to use small purchase procedures as well. The third type of procurement we're going to talk about is similar to the small procur procurement method, but it's a bit more formal. Formal procurement is a process that's used when the value of what you're purchasing exceeds the small purchase threshold of $250,000 or less if it's more restrictive at your local district. With formal procurement, there are two options, invitation for bid or IFB and request for proposal or RFP. The difference between an IFB and an RFP is that the IFB is awarded based on lowest price while an RFP is awarded based on lowest price and other factors as well that are specified in the solicitation document. An IFB results in a fixed price while the RFP can be a fixed price or cost reimbursable. Cost reimbursable just means that you pay the vendors the cost for the product plus a set fee that's agreed upon in the contract. Both the IFB and RFP need to be advertised publicly and the IFP must be opened separately while the RFP is not. And of course, the selected vendor must be responsive and responsible. And as with all types of procurement, it's incredibly important to make sure that you're keeping documentation. And this is especially true with formal procurement. So whether it's an invitation for bid or a request for proposal, make sure that you have a copy of the public advertisement that was placed a copy of all bids and offers that were received, copy of the evaluation, what was used to score the results of uh, the bids and the offers that were received, and a copy of the final contract that was awarded and any notices that went out to vendors who were not awarded the contract. The procurement process with food service management companies is a little bit different. An FSMC is a commercial enterprise that an SFA would contract with to manage any aspect of the school food service program. With an FSMC procurement process, you will always use the RFP, Request for Proposal, procurement process. The duration of the contract can be for one year with up to four annual renewals. And there are very specific requirements that must be in an FSMC contract or contract renewal so it's very important that if this is something you will be doing, that you reach out to us, the state agency, for assistance. It also requires state agency approval prior to soliciting any quotes and prior to the contract renewal each year. There are two policies that school nutrition programs are required to have. The first is procurement code of conduct, and the second are procurement procedures. These are actually required for all programs that receive federal funds and not just school nutrition, so your district should already have these in place. Let's go into each. A procurement code of conduct is a required policy that you must have. It's a set of rules designed to protect the federal dollars that you receive, and it aims to prevent conflicts of interest throughout the procurement process and to also govern the actions of employees. As someone who is directly involved with the procurement process for the school nutrition pro program, you really should know what the policy says. So at a minimum, it needs to prohibit real or apparent conflicts of interest for employees that are engaged in or part of the selection, award, and administration of contracts. Employees are also prohibited from accepting or soliciting any gifts or incentives. And the policy must also include discipline actions for violations. So basically, you or someone close to you cannot benefit from the purchases that your program makes. And there also must be disciplinary actions if this is violated. So for example, let's say you're putting out a bid for a prime vendor and your spouse happens to work for one of the, the companies in our state um, that we, you'd be soliciting. You would need to disclose this information and also remove yourself from the procurement process. 
or if a contract needed to be approved or what we call awarded by your school board, and there's a school board member that works for one of these companies, this is also considered a conflict of interest and the school board member must remove themselves from this process. In terms of prohibiting gifts and incentives, if a vendor or a potential vendor offers to pay for you to attend a conference and travel expenses, for example, you cannot accept this as this would be accepting a gift. Or if the PTA is holding a cookout and they ask you to get donations from the bread company that you buy from, this is also not allow allowable because it's considered soliciting donations. So the code of conduct policy is one that you must be familiar with and it's also important that you go over it with your staff on an annual basis. In addition to the code of conduct that we just talked about, you must also have documented procurement procedures. The purpose of procurement procedures is to have a process in place to guide you through procurement and to make sure the regulations are being followed. There are templates available that you can use. We have one on our website and um, there's also one that many schools use from the Maine School Management Association. However, you really should be customizing the procedures so it reflects your actual process. Think of it as an instruction manual for how you handle procurement in your school nutrition program. If the procurement procedures that you already have in place are school board approved, um, you probably don't wanna customize that document as it's more broad and designed for all of the programs in your district that receive federal funds. So in that case, you perhaps could develop a more customized plan specific to the school nutrition program, um, but one that also accompanies and complies with district procedures. So that's really what's, what's recommended so that you do have procedures that are specific for your school nutrition program. The school nutrition programs do receive procurement reviews. They run on the same schedule as the administrative reviews do. So that's typically once every five years, if not more often. And during the review, we are gonna request documentation from you. The documentation should show how you made the decision to purchase from a vendor. We will ask for your vendor paid list, which is a summary of all vendors paid from the school nutrition account and the total dollar amount spent. We will also ask for copies of statements, your solicitation documents, invoices, and any contracts if you have formal procurement. We will also ask for a copy of the procurement procedures and code of conduct so that we can review those to, that make sure they're complying with federal regulations. And this concludes our procurement training. If you have any questions, please reach out to our office or to me directly with the information on the screen.